Welcome back. So we're going to begin uh, a new section now, which is on diffusion as biology's null hypothesis for dynamics. And I would put this as part of a broader theme, which is, of course, I think anybody that's studied the living world knows, and I don't mean studying in a formal sense, I just mean looking at the world around you, we see that the living, living organisms are dynamic. <clears throat> and so this next part of the course is going to embrace that reality first by thinking about diffusion, which is going to, as I say here, be our null hypothesis for dynamics, but we're, of course we're going to find many exceptions where the dynamics is not diffusive at all, and that, that will be fine. That will be part of the fun of what's coming up. So I just want to remind you that we already encountered diffusion in a rather cursory fashion in the form of two puzzles. Uh, the first one that I posed had to do with a sprinter and, for example, somebody like Usain Bolt at the start line the moment that he hears the starting gun, there's basically the propagation of an action potential along his nerve cells, and also there's diffusion across the synaptic gap between adjacent cells, as you see here. And we were, we were going to be, or are interested in, and the time it takes for these neurotransmitters to move across that, say, 30 nanometer gap. And what you'll recall is that we actually examined this question and there were kind of two key theoretical aspects to what we did. The first one was, uh, I think, very, very cool and had to do with the idea of, uh, in a way, getting to fix law by pure thought. And what I mean by that is that we were interested in the flux between two adjacent planes of atoms or molecules. and. What we did is we said, well, the, the flux, first of all, it has units of number of molecules per uh, area per time, and that should be related linearly to the gradient in the concentration. So what I mean by that is that the, the steeper the gradient, the larger the flux will be. You see that there's a minus sign in our constitutive model here, and the reason for that is the minus sign basically accounts for the fact that if the, if the uh, if the concentration is increasing with position x, in other words, has slope that's greater than zero, then that means the flux will be in the negative direction. We, we found that there was this constant of proportionality, the constant of proportionality being the uh, diffusion coefficient itself, which we worked out had units of length squared over time. That was very important for all of our endeavors. And the other thing that we did is we estimated this idea for the diffusion time. And I show you that just as a recap at the bottom, where we ask the question, how long does it take a molecule to diffuse a distance L? And by dimensional analysis, we argued that that should go like L squared uh, over D. And we're going to invoke that over and over again. So that's kind of by way of background. Um, just as a, a reminder, the, we, we talked about diffusion coefficients having a, a range of different scales. I had mentioned that, that uh, ions, as you can see at the top, have diffusion coefficients of, let's say, on the order of 10 to the 3 microns squared per second. Typical proteins, as you also see in the table, let's say the number I would carry around in my head is around 10 microns squared per second. And then things that are larger uh, are, are even slower in their diffusion. And this, this is mainly just to give you a sense of how the diffusion coefficient in cytoplasm is adjusted relative to its value in water. So the idea being, and not surprisingly, that the diffusion coefficient goes down, it's less, molecules are less mobile in the cytoplasm than they are in the bulk. Okay, so with all that as a, a background, in the sense that we already broached this subject, but casually, now what we're going to do is we're going to try and more formally attack the, the question of diffusion. And in some ways, one could say that the birth of the subject began with this paper by Robert Brown, the title of which is A Brief Account of Microscopical Observations Made in the Months of June, July, and August, 1827, on the particles containing the pollen of plants and on the general existence of active molecules in organic and inorganic bodies. And this is great because really what, what we're witness to here is a, a major discovery. And it's a major discovery that was part of the drama that surrounded the question of whether or not there's new forces, new stuff associated with living organisms that are outside of the purview of traditional physics, I guess I would say. And it depends how you think of that. You know, the, the notion of vitalism, I think, in some sense has been quite debunked. 
But the idea that there would be new physics in thinking about the living world, I, I wouldn't think of that as being surprising in the least, and that was the argument that was made by Schrodinger, as I talked about in an earlier vignette. So Robert Brown uh, was interested, he was interested in plants. He was, uh, if I remember correctly, he was the curator of Kew Gardens in, in London, and he was very interested in plants and was studying pollen, and, and he was looking at pollen in a microscope, and what he found is that it jiggled around. That's it. He found that it jiggled around. And he was perplexed by this and, you know, tempted by the idea that maybe this, this dynamics was something special to living organisms. And so this led to a series of, you know, what in modern parlance we would refer to as controls. And what the controls told him is, no, that has nothing to do with a living organism. It's, it's sort of the fate of, of all tiny objects that is there in solution they will be jiggling around. And it took maybe 100 years to understand the basis of that jiggling, but that's what he discovered. In around 1910, let's say, Jean Perrin, who was a French scientist, uh, an experimentalist, a contemporary of people like Einstein and Smolachowski and Langevin, who has had as theorists considered the topic of Brownian motion, he basically did microscopical observations. And what you're seeing here are his measurements of what we would now call the random walk. Uh, which will be one of the main ways that we will think about diffusion. So what he was able to do was to figure out exactly what we said a few minutes ago, which is how long it took to go a certain distance L, or said differently, how far do objects go as a function of time. And there you'd find that the distance scales like the square root of the time elapsed. So these were very important measurements, and I commend you to take a look at his book called Atoms. So one of the key ideas to emerge from all this is something that we're going to carry with us through the rest of the course, and hopefully you'll carry with you for the rest of your thinking in science, and that's the notion of thermal energy, specifically at room temperature. So thermal energy is measured in units of joules, and you'll see that there's this notion of the Boltzmann constant, Kb, which has units of joules per degree Kelvin, and so if I take room temperature, which is roughly 300 degrees Kelvin, then what I will find is that the thermal energy is 4 times 10 to the minus 21 joules, or 4 piconewton nanometers. And the reason that I bring this up is that at the end of the day, all of that hustle and bustle of the molecules that was observed by Brown is the result of collisions with molecules which just are carrying around energy by virtue of existing at finite temperature. What I'm trying to say is that you know every molecule in the room in which I'm sitting right here is jiggling around at hundreds of meters per second and they carry with them a, a kinetic energy. If I were to take a liter of the gas from this room, just a liter, it has enough kinetic energy to lift a bowling ball up to the ceiling. So there's a lot of energy stored in these molecular motions. And they manifest themselves by colliding into, for example, a grain of pollen and leading it to jiggle around. The, because the collisions are not coherent, you don't get a, a, you know, a ballistic looking trajectory. At one moment, the particle's moving in one direction, another moment it's moving in another direction, and so on and so forth. So these are the kinds of ideas that are, are behind, um, behind our thinking on diffusion. So we're going to uh, really put on our theorist caps here. And the reason that I say it that way is that we're going to attack the problem of diffusion three different ways, and they're going to give us the same answers. But I really want to hearken back to a beautiful thing said in the Nobel lecture of Richard Feynman, who talked about what the so-called psychological inequivalence of methodologies that give you the same answers on a given problem. So what I'm saying here is that I can think about diffusion as coin flips. I can think about diffusion using continuum theory leading to the so-called diffusion equation and in the language of Fick's law. And I can also use chemical master equations, which are probabilistic. And all of them will tell me that x squared goes like time. In other words, that particles uh, will, will jiggle around and how far away they'll get from the origin goes uh, like the square root of time. So that part's generic, but this notion of psychological in inequivalence is the idea that, okay, well maybe you have the same methodology, sorry, different methodologies for attacking the same problem, but when it comes to investigating the unknown, one of them might be superior to the other. And in Feynman's case, he was talking about quantum mechanics, for example, and the use of Schrodinger's equation or matrix of mechanics or path integrals. But for, for it, it really, I think, applies to me classical mechanics where you could use energy methods or you could use force methods. You could use Lagrangian mechanics or principle of least action or whatever. They will, in general, like if you think about the problem of planetary motion, they're gonna give you the same answer. On the other hand, when you strike off into the unknown, 
it's not at all clear which one of those will be superior for sort of getting us to think in the right way about something we haven't thought about before. So at any rate, what's going to happen in the coming vignettes is the first one will be about coin flips, the second one will be about continuum theories, and the third one will be about the chemical master equation. And all of these will give us ideas that we will borrow again and again through the remainder of the, the course. So that's the, that's the, the project as, uh, as I see it. And so uh, with that, I stop this particular vignette, which is really just an introduction, introduction to diffusion. And we will embrace with enthusiasm this idea of thinking about diffusion from the point of view of, of coin flips.